Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina and my guest today is Keith Leonard from Meets All Done. Well, that's part of your, one of your companies, right? Kind of. <laughs> um, so like from what I've read, you started back in school, right? It was like just lunchtime activity when you start learning how to knit. Yes, I was in elementary school and I, um, my, when I, my teacher, Carol, who's one of my best friends today, did a uh, just like a little social knitting at lunchtime. And um, I kind of just took off with it from there. <laughs> so do you remember like the first kind of projects that you used to do? Yes, ruffle scarves. Um, and it was in the prism, the stuff yarn. And I remember the first time, like my mom drove me to a knitting store and she didn't know a knitting store even existed. And I went in and I, and I picked out this ball of yarn and I put it on the counter. And I think they said like, that'll be $90 or something. <laughs> it was just like this one thing of like all the hand dyed, hand uh, tied yarns. And it was just like, uh, all we were making were ruffle scarves where we would just quickly increase and Right. Then ruffle scars like came a huge phase a few years ago. I know. Yeah, it's like I actually did one just a couple of years ago. A friend of mine gave me that yarn for um, for my birthday and I've never seen it before. So I was like, what what do I do with that? But that was <laughs> yeah, like and I mean, now they made it like, you know, that you can knit into the little holes and it automatically right. ruffles. It takes all the work out. <laughs> right. right. Um, so like what was about knitting that got you so addicted to it I don't know I was always I was always into crafts I never stuck with anything and knitting I feel like it just had so many avenues where you could you know you paint and you kind of paint but there was so many different techniques and projects to make and stitches to learn and all the colors of the yarn and I just I I, mean, I enjoyed it and I it, I picked up on it for sure I like it was like one thing that like I actually got like I couldn't play the trumpet that never worked but I was able to get knitting <laughs> So, so when you were knitting, how, what was your learning process like? Did you go, like, did you look at books? Did you go on YouTube? Like, where did you learn all those techniques from? Man, it was going, going to the local store. Um, I don't know. I don't think YouTube was really that big of a thing there. It was, it was mostly going to the knitting store and uh, my friend Shana, who I know you did an interview with, um, she worked at the knitting store that I went to. She was, so, so she taught me, I mean, Shana taught me a lot. Well, how were, how, how, what was the reaction of the people working in that store when you came there? Like, was it like, oh my God, look how at this cute little- Oh, oh look how cute he is. You know, that, that kind of never left. Um, <laughs> I still get that, <laughs> but I think I got it more back then. It was, oh, look how, but like, it was also like, look how cute he is. Oh my gosh, he could do everything. Um, so I, I loved it. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I still consider that like childhood and I considered my childhood memories, like just little pictures. Like I don't really remember stuff. Um, so like I have images in my head of me in that, that store. And it was like one of those yarn stores where there's like, I mean, it's like yarn, like floor to ceiling, bulging everywhere yarn. Um, and it was on the second floor and it was a fun, it was like, a, it was a magical place. I think, especially when you're I mean, any adult can go into a knitting store and it's like, oh, I'm in heaven. But when you're a kid in all the colors and textures, it's like, it's like a candy store. Right. So now your name on Instagram is Yarn Snob. Yes. When did you become a yarn snob? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is so all over the place. It's such a, it's such a hot mess. Um, so should I start with knits all done or should I start with when I changed to yarn snob? Oh. Um, Let's do the yarn snub first. Okay. So, um, well, I started dyeing yarn a cup, like almost, I, I want to say like almost two years ago now. And so I had a previous company that I kind of just was like, let's get rid of that one and swap this one. So I just switched the name. <laughs> But so, like, what was the idea behind yarn snob? Like, why yarn snob? Like, do you really discriminate against some of the yarns? You know, that's interesting because I saw a video that someone did that was like, don't be a yarn snob. Everyone can knit and whatever they want. And I totally, I totally agree with that. But I, uh, I guess I would call myself a yarn snob. And I, you know, it really came down to 
I was only going to dye a fiber that I actually wanted to knit with. I wasn't going to dye something that like I personally did not want to knit with. Um, you know, I went to a mill and my yarn is custom made because I wanted a lower micron count that I can get from most of the suppliers. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, supplying a more luxury uh, product. Um, but really, it came down to what I wanted to work with. Right. Um, but do you remember, like, what was your journey, how you discovered the exact yarn that you loved the most? I, I'm a sweater knitter. I love knitting sweaters. That's like my thing. Like if, if and when I would be in a yarn store, store and see a yarn that I want to knit with, it would be how much yarn do I need for a sweater? It was never like, oh, just one ball of this or, oh, I need to get enough for a shawl or a scarf, sweater. And what I found out, found out what, it was, what I was doing is I was buying sweater quantities of yarn and then I was knitting a swatch and then I realized I didn't like the yarn. And now you have a whole sweater quantity of it. Um, Cause my favorite thing to do is play. Um, I love playing. I, I always, I, I think it's, there's knitting and there's yarn and I love, I love both, but I love yarn and I love to play. I don't need to make another sweater. Um, I love knitting the yarn, washing it, seeing how it reacts, seeing how it blooms, seeing the drapes, seeing, you know, so much happens when you block it. So now if I see a yarn that I want to knit with for myself, I buy one ball and I play with it. And if it's worthy, I'll buy the sweater quantity. Um, so that's really how I, you know, it was mix and match practicing, learning about the plies, learning about how they took take take the color. That's an important factor. How they hold up, do they pill, do they? So I just bought and played with everything. So what I, was the first color you tried on your own? Um, so, you know, this really started with me in my garage in one pot just trying to make what is now happiness. I have a skein of it here um, where I um, put all the colors in. And I was like, I, I have to like, I, I have to admit in the beginning, I was just like, how hard could it be? It's all the colors. You just throw them in. And apparently like you can't just throw all the colors in because you get brown. Um, and then it turned into like a, how do people do this? And then like, I just, I mean, if you were to see if you were to see the, the garbage bags full of yarn that I ruined, <laughs> I mean, it was not fun at first. Like, there were, I was, there was, a, I was like tearing on the couch and my husband said, don't give up. Keep, he said, if you were, if you were taking golf lessons, you'd have to pay someone for golf. You have to learn. Um, and now like we were just labeling yarn last night and he, and he was, he was like, he was like, dear, your dying has gotten good. I'm glad you didn't, I'm glad you didn't give up. <laughs> so I mean, so Practice. nice that you have the support at home. No? Yes, absolutely. Um, so like, if you ruin yarn, is there a way to recover it? Oh, yeah. So when I say like when I was learning and I was ruining yarn, it was not, the dye was not set properly. It was bleeding. It was, that had to be trashed. Um, nowadays, uh, I, I, I used to dye it black because I have so many items that need black yarn, but even that now, it's just, there's not time for that. So honestly, everything, and when I say mess up these days, it's all fine. It's just, if it was supposed to be this color and has a spot of this, I can't sell it as that color. It all gets thrown in a big bucket. And then uh, a couple of like twice a year, I do a like 40 to 70% off. Um, I just like twist three of them together. There's no labels and they're, you know, they, they, they all, within 15 minutes, they're always gone. So, um, well, talking about sweater quantities, right? Let's say somebody bought a couple skeins and then like a year went by and they decided to make sweater with that, but they realized that they need one extra skein. Mm -hmm. Will it match? Like how exact are you in your colors? So every oh, part is like, well, story. happiness, happiness, every single ball is different, um, which is why we have these giant skeins. Um, so happiness is that, you know, you can alternate new ones in. In terms of other colors, I don't dye, I don't dye based on formulas. I don't even know, what it's, that's too scientific. To me, it's more, it's an art form. And I mean, this is good and bad because I could never really hire someone to dye my colors for me because I know what they look like in my head. So when I am going to dye a color, I, I dye it based on what it's supposed to look like. Um, so the best thing is, you know, it's rare, but every once in a while, someone will run out of yarn and I say, send me a piece of the yarn and I could pretty much 
almost exactly match it, you would still need to alternate it in no matter what you're, you, if you didn't, you'd have a color break, but um, I haven't had too much of a problem with dye lot issues. So that's been good. Right. Well, so before dyeing yarn, you were doing finishing business. So you yes. had uh, needs all done. Yes. And to me, this is like such a like polar opposites of each other, because when you finishing, this is like the final touch. This is what makes the item, right? Because you can have like, I mean, if the finishing work is not done properly, it's just all going to be wonky. So you have this like people trusting you with like what they were doing, the pro projects that they were like creating for a certain period of time, and they trust you to make it perfect, right? Yes. Whereas the yarn is like throw a pinch of this. It's like it's more like cooking, right? It's like uh, artistic form. Never thought of it that way, and it's like I guess I'm gonna quote you on that because it's <laughs> yeah, it's like the the end process and now the beginning of the process. Right. I mean, to me, it's like I actually had that conversation with Suzanne Bryan because I told her that I I love cooking and I'm not a fan of baking, and she was like, to me, it's the same thing. And I was like, no, 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 because baking, it's exact formula. You follow like yeah. one tablespoon of tree. right? Whereas cooking is just like pinch of this and a little spoon <laughs> of that, you know. So it's like it gives you more artistic freedom. So to me, yarn dyeing is that exactly absolutely, yeah. Right. But. Did you feel like you were just, you've had enough with the exactness and precision and you wanted to go like more? Yeah, I am. I, mean, I always say I'm the type of person that like three years from now, I could be saying, remember when I used to dye yarn? Like I'm always just going for the next thing. Um, but I started and it's all done when I was out of college. Um, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I, you know, I worked at knitting stores and I started the finishing business. And honestly, I never thought anyone would actually put something they made in the mail and mail it to me, but man, that was never a problem. Um, and I love doing the finishing and I did it for years. The only problem is when I started dyeing yarn that took off so fast and I had zero time. And then when a box would arrive, I just got so stressed that I would shut down and I couldn't sleep. It was just bad. And I had to make a decision and it was like, goodbye <laughs> so do you think you're gonna come back to that I always think that it'd be a perfect job for retirement like like however many years from now I could be like go back to my roots and like start doing it we're finishing again wherever I am on this earth <laughs> so oh no, it's interesting though I was watching a video of you on Instagram actually doing the finishing and it's like it shocked me because in my mind, when I imagine you doing the sewing the sweater, right? Like if I'm finishing something, it's a very slow, like I'm <laughs> like unsure process, right? I'm trying to line up all the stitches and make sure that it's exactly just so. And you go like boom, 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 pull the string, you know? I mean, everything <laughs> was practice. If you're if you're putting sweaters together all day. Um, so, you know, people, people would say like, I can't believe how fast you're finishing these things. And I'm like, like, I don't think you realize that while you're at work all day, like I'm literally sitting doing this all day. <laughs> so, but you know, speed comes with practice. But like, was it meditative for you to, to do the oh, yeah. finishing? I mean, I would just, I mean, I wouldn't even watch TV or listen to music. I would just sit in silence and like zone out in, I love mattress stitch. I love seeming, you know, every time I hear like, oh, like I would always hear like, oh, I hate the seam. Oh, oh, thank goodness for Keith. No one likes that. And I was like, I don't, they, they, people would say it takes such a long time. And I always thought like, well, doesn't like knitting take a long time? Like it, it took a lot longer than knit the sweater than for me to seam it. <laughs> like, so. Um, but. What's, what do you prefer like for yourself? Like what gives you more pleasure to knit or to seam? Oh, interesting. Um, I would say seaming. If it's just like a straight piece of mattress stitch, I just love it. I just, it's the, the satisfaction when you pull and it just closes. I don't think that will ever get old. You know what? It's funny because I was just telling somebody that when I was younger, I was like trying to get into sewing. And what I loved the most was hand hemming the item. So I would cut it 
I would hand him the whole thing, which would take me like a week, right? To do every single scene. And then I would lose interest and I would never finish it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it was like the hand sewing was like the actually what gave me the most satisfaction. And then I would just lose interest completely. So. I mean, when it comes to even knitting, I'm a like stockinette stitch. That's all I do these days. That I love stock. I can, you know, and I have a friend who like can't knit stockinette for the life of her. She needs tables and lace and all these patterns and charts. And I don't want any of that. I just want to sit, do my stockinette stitch. Did you teach your husband how to knit yet? No, he's a he's an he's an excellent knitter. So uh Chuck um worked for a long time for Scassell and I met him at Vogue originally in New York City. So he's He's been knitting for many years. Does he take all your yarn that you're dyeing? Do you ever have to fight over like this no, yarn? Really. Sale? <laughs> it's yarn. He has he has more yarn than I do. Like it's under our kitchen island. It's in his office. It's in my office. Um, but no, not really. But it's great because like he'll knit samples and he designs stuff. And you know, he's also full time here. Um he does literally, I mean, if you send an email to me, you're talking to Chuck, he does all the shipping, he does all the schedule. I mean, he does a lot. Right. Do you, do you ever like get inspired by each other's needs? Do you ever need the same thing? Right now we're both knitting cardigan, a lightweight cardigan, but he he's writing the pattern. He's better at designing. I just, I need nine, but I do my stock in it stitch. So, um, so I don't know if we're too inspired from each other. We bounce ideas off of each other for sure. Um, I don't know. I, I, anytime I say like, do you like this? And he's like, oh, like I, I held buttons the other day. I was going to knit a sweater based on these buttons I love. And he was like, yeah, I don't like that together. And I was like, crap, <laughs> now I don't want to do it. So maybe less, went, is, less talking is more. <laughs> there went that idea. <laughs> exactly. Well, you are like good friends with Josh Stein. So Josh was my first. He was mm -hmm. the first guest of Fiber Chats. He was actually the one who made Fiber Chats possible because I was chatting with him about some yarn and I was like, you know, I have this idea. Maybe like, what if I asked some, some of my friends and like I interviewed them and he's like, let me just finish my cake and we, we're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> But when you're friends with like other indie dyers, do you look at their work? Does that inspire you? Does that give you some new ideas? Does that show you some possibilities? Do you look at it as competition? Like what's the relationship with other dyers? Um, well, I'm gonna start with this. Do you, do you know how Josh and I met? No, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so like Josh messaged me on Instagram and he was like, hey, I'm just like, I'm just another dyer. I just want to say your work's amazing. Like, nice to meet you. And like, I messaged him back and I thought that was very nice, which I'll get into in a minute. But then I was in my kitchen in August cooking potato latkes and I accidentally video chatted him on Instagram and he answered and we just started talking. And like, were you still like, crying at that point? Because I saw that video of you crying. Oh no, that was that was another Hanukkah <laughs> dinner I made in August. But um, this was when I was back in Florida and I was like perfecting latkes. But so like, I remember like my husband, like Chuck walked in and he was like, who's that? Like I was on the phone and I was like, oh. And I was like, what's your name? <laughs> and, like, I didn't even know his name. Um, and we've spoken like literally every day since. So I think it's just a funny way to become friends with just randomly call someone on Instagram. Um, no, but he's he's really good, first of all. Um, very precise for sure. He he laughs at me because you like like we call each other in our dye studios and like I'm just like shaking the dye and I have a salt shaker and he's like, you don't even know how much you're putting in. And I'm like, I'll call a little bit of this, a little bit of that. <laughs> um I there I feel like the I feel like the dyers are very competitive, like everyone's yarn is the best. And um, I'm not like that at all. I actually bought a lot of yarn from Josh. Um, I have his mini skein sets and I have his uh, cashmere, which we sold out of. So um, no, I just, I think the more the merrier. I think there's plenty to go around for everyone. And I buy yarn from other people too. So I'm never like, I'm never gonna be like, you know, a lot of dyers are very much, it's, it's my yarn or no one else's yarn. Right. So I'm like, share the wealth. So like, did the fact that you had needs all done helped you with starting the new business? Like, were those people instantly becoming? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I upset 
quite a few people. I mean, I have a wonderful friend, my friend Dory in New Jersey, who I recommend to do finishing, and she's incredible. Um, yes, it helped, but let me tell you, had I said, I'm going to get a pot and start dyeing yarn and start a yarn company, this I, we wouldn't be here. Um, this was all accidental. And like, obviously, it's in the same field and industry. Um, so I, you know, I had a, a little bit of a name out there. But um, this was totally, this was not planned in a sense that I said, this is what I'm going to do. I kind of just rolled with it. We don't even have, like, we don't have a logo, really. I think Chuck, like, that yarn snob, he just made, like, a font on Microsoft Word. Like, everything just, and I feel like that's the best way when things are just going so fast that you can't, you know. Um, so I, I put an ad in a magazine for an orchid show, which is another story, but they said, like, send us your logo and your blah, blah. And I was like, we don't have any of this stuff. Right. So everything just kind of took off really fast. Also, the pan, I would say, if anything, the pandemic was... I want to say helpful, but in the same sense that knitting was, it was big and it, yeah, exacerbated everything. So when you sell now, do you have like always something in stock? Do you die and do the shop updates? How do you run your business? Um, so that's a very interesting question. It's kind of a little all over the place. Um, we always, we try to always have happiness, parables in stock. Um, the, the parables have been very popular. Um, it's really what's popular at the moment. A lot of like, so Shana has designed a lot of kits and a lot of, I mean, you know, pretty much this all started with just, uh, just this one happiness color and it, you know, it, happiness fingering with gray fingering, happiness worsted with black worsted. So we have buckets of like happiness worsted, happiest fingering white yarn, gray yarn, black yarn, that all the kits can just be put together like that. Um, right now, assigned pooling is the big thing. Um, so I'm working on these, which are all hand painted. Um, so most of the time when an order come, gets placed, I will dye it that day or the next day. And then it's dry before I have to write them and tell them it's going to be dyed. So, nice. you know, I dye yarn literally every day. So it's just as the orders come in. Do, do this, 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 like it's just in the order. So like, are you satisfied with the business side of it? Like with the amount of income it produces? Like, do you see yourself as still at the very beginning of it? Do you, do you think- oh, I think you know, I would say I'm very goal? satisfied right now, especially since in the beginning, since we were having this uh, base custom milled, you have to order, a, you have to order a lot, like right. pallets worth. And like, it was like, fingering and then you need a the worst did and it was like so at first it was just like there's no money because you know you're buying but then but now that you have all the bases in massive quantities when you run out you only have to buy one when it runs out and you know when it gets slow it's not like you're buying everything at once right. um so things are you know evening out now do you have a dream for this business do you like see do you have a clear vision of like what you're trying to achieve next year let's say Oh, no clue. No clue. <laughs> Things I just, no, no, there is no planning here. It is, I mean, most of my emails that I sell out, I think of like the morning I wake up and be like, oh, this was a good idea. Or this, I just saw this, I was scrolling through Instagram and that's a great pattern that'll work with this. I mean, things are very little is planned. Um, so I know that you do a lot of uh, stuff with Shayna, but do you like collaboration in general? Like, do, are you looking for other designers to collaborate? I'm always happy. Yes, um, I love collaborating, and Shane is amazing. And yeah, I love I love that. And you know, it's so it's pattern sell yarn. It's so true. Um, and it's you know, I just think about like we have this cowl. Chuck actually designed it, and it's called the crisscross cowl. And that thing- I saw that. I just saw you doing that video. That, showing how that cowl has literally sold pallets of worsted just for that one little cowl. And I'm telling you, if we didn't have it, we'd be sitting on this dead yarn. Like it's just like, and I call it that because like it's, it's, it's amazing how much patterns sell yarn. But um, I also think like, so there's two sides to, to it for me personally, because yes, like the- pattern sells yarn but also the yarn sells the pattern because like your choice of yarn for the particular That's true. Like, show and like then, a couple different options of the same thing i don't know if you just saw shana's crosshatch her new shawl 
and that and that's a great example because I mean, it kind of does both because the yarn needs to be very, it needs to be dyed in a very specific way for that shawl to work. You can't just use any yarn and the pattern, you know, kind of sell, it shows, it kind of does that. It, the pattern sells the yarn. Right. No, I just had the same experience. So I was interviewing Rasta Shu and he just came up with this, uh, this particular lace shawl actually. Oh, and he is in black and white and it's like super contemporary photo shoot. Like it's him modeling it so it's like super cool like um metropolitan sort of like look to it right whereas this is like almost like victorian it, yeah feels, that is right beautiful. because i use the more hair and i use like the purples and pinks and it's like it makes it super feminine and i was posting my progress pictures in some of the facebook groups and one of the most common comments was oh when i saw it I thought it wasn't for me, but now that I see your version, like mm -hmm. I really want to make that shawl. And I find that like very often that like people would, if you have like, a if you're a designer and you have like five different projects shown on your Ravelry, one of them will sell that pattern, not necessarily the one that the designer had the vision, but like sometimes just the testers post their projects and that's what's going to sell the pattern. So because everybody has their own like aesthetic and people click it, yeah, that true. yarn choice and not that yarn choice you know it's, it's like, so true and you know things worked up in different yarns and different colors can look like completely different projects okay. well i wanted to ask you another question so recently i was test knitting a shawl mm -hmm. and the designer suggested the yarn dyer who made kits specifically for that shawl so i got the kit and i two colors were like just uh, ba basic like um gray gray and black and the middle color was like speckled brownish goldish black and gray and i didn't love the color like in the skin i saw it and i was like well you know it's it's cute and i had something in my stash that i thought would look better and i was asking the designer like do you think it's okay if i'll substitute one color and she was like well honestly like i want to help that dyer to sell her kids as well so like why won't you start with that? And then if you really don't like it, switch to your color. And I started knitting and I realized it was absolutely perfect. Like it was so beautiful because I looked at the skin, but like when it came with a turn to fabric, it was just stunning. Yeah, I mean, it. it's, I was thinking about that the other night because I have a, new yarn I'm coming out with soon. And I was just thinking about the first time I saw it, I didn't like it until I knit it. And it's so rare for that to happen to me. Cause like, if there's one skill in this world I have, I can look at a ball of yarn and I know how it's going to knit up where I think a lot of people can't. And right. on, like, everyone always asks, can I see it sw a swatch? And I'm like, if I had to knit up every color, I like, it would be, it's literally impossible. Um, and that's why I say like, part of this is playing buy the yarn. It, it's okay if you knit it and you don't like it. Like it's, it's, I, un, like, I understand it, that it's a, it's, it's an expense, but this whole industry, this whole hobby is an expense. We don't need a sweater. Like, so I, you know, I'm all for try it, see if you like it. Well, if you don't like it, learn to die, throw another color on it. Like if you had to do a presentation to let's say the wide audience out there and explain why they have to buy, why they should buy from you versus like all the thousand other dyers that are out there. What would you say, like what differentiates you from the rest? I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nuts. Um, I do stuff that no one else will go near. My, I don't have any photos of it. I do this thing where uh, I put zip ties around the yarn and then I dye the yarn and then I cut the zip ties off and it has little specks of white. And like, I know that doesn't sound like too crazy, but when you have to do 300 that are like, it's very <laughs> time consuming the zip tie the yarn. Um, if you've seen my orchid colors, I don't do the whole inspired by a photo. I do a, it needs to look exactly like the photo. Um, so I, I, I care deeply about how this stuff looks. Um, but I think other people's stuff is, but my friend, Samantha from Whimsical Wood is like, she's like amazing. Like, like she's 
she's like the queen of it. So like, I will never, I will never say my stuff's better than anyone's. It's right. So you also mentioned to me that you teach, you give instructions on like finishing yes. and I, like you have classes until now, right? You, you do classes now as well. Yes. I'm on zoom like all night every night so um yeah i do um a lot like i'm always teaching like finishing of course is like my core so i'm still happy to always teach it um and i have lots of class i've been doing a lot of crochet lately um and you know i i i, I have i used to travel the country teaching that was part of my whole you know with the finishing um i've done pretty much every vogue knitting live there's been for the past five years except for you know the past I was I was actually sick and then COVID canceled um, New York City, I guess two years in a row now. Um, and I've done almost every virtual um, Vogue as well. So I, I definitely get out there with the teaching. Well, what's your favorite thing about teaching? Hmm. I guess the excitement of seeing it, seeing someone get something. And I love the I like to think of my, I like to think of myself as like the last resort teacher. I get a lot of like, I've taken nine classes of this and like, there's all, so I was a special education major in college and I feel like, and people always laugh, but I, I really, because they're, they're like, oh, it's perfect for the, all the knitters here. But um, I always find a way for someone to get it. So like, if I'm working with a Zoom and like, I'll put 15 people on hold and like, it's, it's almost like a game for me. Like I'll, and like, I'll read what they're thinking, what they're saying. And like, all I have to do is tweak one word. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's easy. I got it. This is amazing. So right. I, 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 I like that aspect of the teaching of the aha moments. So do you remember your very first class that you taught? Yeah, it was a shit show. <laughs> it was so bad. It was a short row class. It was in person. It was in New Jersey. It was at, um, my friend Beverly's store. Hi, Bev, if you're watching this. Um, I was like 12, <laughs> like, but I walked in and I put the pattern in front of like everyone and I said, do this. And it was complicated. And it was, I actually was teaching short rows on Zoom a couple of months ago. And I was talking about how bad that class was. And I had a woman in my Zoom class that was there in New Jersey at that <laughs> class. And she was like, he's not kidding. It was really bad. <laughs> well, did you doubt yourself at that point? Like, it's hard no. to be like I, I in, my mind, in my mind, in my mind, right? You know, like when you come back. into the class and you you are the expert, you have to know everything about but you're not the expert when you first start doing it. You're just faking it till you make it. So I mean that's like my whole thing in life. So I walk, I just I'm the teacher. We're gonna all listen to what I say. Um it's gotten better, I promise. Um, but that was back then. What what lesson did you learn for yourself, like about teaching? Like what? Oh, you need to break you things down. <laughs> you need you need to break. I've always had the patience, so that's never been a problem. Uh, it's the the breaking things down and going slowly. Don't rush through it. Um, that's right. a. Do you ever feel a, like you frustrated because you don't have enough time to teach what you want to teach? No, I feel like in terms of classes, my, I, my, to this day, my biggest fear in a class is that there's not gonna be enough material to keep the whole class, like that's, that. so it's never like there's not, a, it's never, it's the opposite. Um, funny enough, the Zoom classes go much faster than in person. You know, I've had to kind of alter and put more stuff into all of my classes and they're two hours instead of three hours. But the, you know, the, the platform of Zoom, I think just works so much better for learning. How um, so, like explain this to me, why? Because in person, I have a room of 25 people. I show something, how to seem something. I quickly bounce around to every single person. No one really, you can't see it. It's so, but on Zoom, I can make your entire computer screen, you know, my hand showing exactly where this, it's, you could see it. That's the thing. You could see it. It's interesting. I didn't think about it that way. And actually I just spoke to Vogue in Seattle. Um, I don't know when that is in a couple of months. I asked if I can get you know, a big screen and a projector, and I'm going to do like a hybrid model of Zoom in the classroom. So we have the social aspect, but you can also see what I'm trying to teach you. Right. No, that's very clever, actually. So when you teach, how much of it is like actually showing stuff and how much of it is you being sort of almost the entertainer of the class? Like what's, what do you see your role as? 
I try to do a mix of both, you know, with the Zoom, I've been doing a lot of demonstrations and let me tell you, that's like the way to go. Do I do it first? I say, I don't like, I don't care if this doesn't make sense. Just, just what it's so much gets sucked up into your brain just by watching. And then when you go to do it, it's so much easier. And I've tested it so many times, even on easy techniques. You know, if I fully demonstrate something and then you do it, it's almost like monkey see monkey do. Is there like any class that you would want to teach that you haven't taught yet? Um, I mean, I'm kind of out of ideas. So if anyone watching this has an idea for a class, come find me. Because I feel like, I, you know, even Vogue asked us if we have more, like, can we, do we have more advanced classes? Because, you know, we've been sitting at our computer for two years now, do it like, like taking knitting classes, like people are like getting good. <laughs> so, um, so no, I mean, I think I've covered, you know, there's, I always say there's, I don't, love everything it's impossible to love everything i don't love you know i don't i'm not obsessed with brioche i like single color brioche because it's very repetitive um but i'll teach it um you know i teach the short rows i love i i just did a class on the mobius i love the mobius cast on so i got like i got very energetic because i love it um i'm really into the crochet so i love that um so it bounces around do you ever feel like you don't want to do any of that anymore like you just want to break and like you want to forget that the world exists for a couple months um i always think that and then like i try to take like three hours off <laughs> and not only do i not know what to do with myself i get depressed and i just end up in bed like i just i am definitely i don't want to say i'm a workaholic like i'm all but i'm always working i can't like like Chuck at the end of the day sits on the couch and watches TV. I can't do that. I am, you know, I get off of Zoom. I go back into the dye studio. I'm twisting yarn until 11 o'clock. Like I just can't not do that. So what's your day like? Where, how do you decide on like at what point you do what? So I wake up at like six, make a cup of coffee, go right into the garage, start dyeing. By around 12 o'clock, I take a nap till like four. <laughs> so I sleep like the major part of the day. And then I get up and I either teach on Zoom, eat dinner, work more. Um, I FaceTime a lot with my friends and um, and then I go back to bed at like midnight. So I, I, my, my, I kind of like have two days in one because I sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up. And that's literally every day. <laughs> Is it the feline influence in your life? You know, it's so funny. I used to hide it and like it, like it works for me. Like my friend, I, I have a friend who's a designer and and she, she needs to sleep like 16 hours. Like she will, she, it's like, it's like high school. Like she will go to sleep at eight o'clock and wake up at 2 PM the next day. And like, I feel like I'm that way too, except I wake up every, I break it up. I wake up early. Um, but like, you will never see me teaching a class in the afternoon. Like you won't, like, if you look at like Vogue schedule, if you look like everyone knows they like cannot schedule me for that afternoon time slot, it's morning and night. Right. Well, you mentioned that like you don't, you're not inspired by a picture in the sense that you like take colors from it, you want exact replica or something. What else inspires you? Like, how do you decide on the colors? Oh, my, my orchids. I have a whole collection of my orchids. So I grow like really rare exotic orchids. And um, I mean, inspiration is an incredible thing because I always say, if you put me in my dye studio with all the colors, I can't really... I, I'm, I mean, to a point I can, but I need direction. And like some of these flowers, I have put color combinations that, I mean, you can lock me in a room with colors and say, you know, keep putting these combinations. I would never have thought to put these colors together. And it's, I love it. So yeah, the, I mean, I know, I know there's a reflection. I would never think to put that gold with the purple there. Right. And I mean, I love it. So yeah, they've taken me on crazy. Also, it makes orchids a business expense. So that, you know, is helpful too. Um, <laughs> but but um, I'm having, this is a new, oh, I don't have it out with me. I just did a new one that I really liked. And yeah, and I'm, I have fun with the orchid thing and the, the you know, the, the people at the orchid place love it. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I should tell you my new thing coming up. You want to hear it? You want a little secret? Um, I am, I had this great idea. So that orchid I just showed you, the green one where it was half and half, I wanted to knit the owner of the orchid farm a hat. 
and I, I wound a ball. And of course, you know, I just said, I know how colors knit up. So like, I knew it was going to mix up the white with the green when I started knitting it, but the flower is very half and half green and white. And I wanted the hat to be like that, but I didn't want to just stripe it because it would have a, you know, I wanted it to fade. So I knit the hat in undyed yarn and then I dyed it when it was done. Oh, that's so cool. And it came out so cool. So I'm going to be launching this whole thing called dyed after or after dyed. I forgot what I said. I settled on and um, everyone's going to knit in undyed yarn and then mail it to me and I'm going to dye the finished product. And I did, you know, I did samples. I have polka dots and ombres and gradients and stripes, and it's going to be so much fun. That sounds amazing. I've never heard anybody doing stuff like that. I haven't either, but my, like, I'm always thinking of like, what's new, what hasn't been done. So. Well, I seriously cannot wait to see everything else you're going to come up with. And I love seeing your Instagram. It always constant, instantly makes me happy somehow. All those colors. Glad to hear that. I, I, you know, I post and then I like forgetting it exists for two weeks and then I post again. Well, thank you so much, Kit, for being my guest today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Best of luck with your business and the new year, you know. Thank you. You as well. Okay, hold on.